Do you know what sign God will give you today? Good morning, everyone. This is our reflection question for today. A guy sees a sign in front of a house, talking dog for sale. He rings the bell and the owner tells him the dog is in the backyard. The guy goes into the backyard and sees a black mutt sitting there. You talk? He asks. Yep, the mutt replies. So what's your story? The mutt looks up and says, Well, I discovered my gift of talking pretty young, and I wanted to help the government, so I told the CIA about my gift. And in no time, they had me jetting from country to country, sitting in rooms with spies and world leaders, because no one figured the dog would be eavesdropping. I was one of their most valuable spies eight years running. The jetting around really tired me out, and I knew I wasn't getting any younger, and I wanted to settle down. So I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security work, mostly wandering near suspicious characters and listening in. I uncovered some incredible dealings there and was awarded a batch of medals. Had a wife, a mess of puppies, and now I'm just retired. The guy is amazed. He goes back in and asks the owner what he wants for the dog. The owner says, $10. The guy says, This dog is amazing. Why on earth are you selling him so cheap? The owner replies, he's a big liar. He didn't do any of that stuff. You can't believe a word, he says. In today's gospel, the crowds that follow Jesus, or at least his enemies, the Pharisees and scribes, continue to pester him, asking for a sign to prove that he really is the Messiah. Some even accused him of invoking the devil's power. They were all looking for a spectacular sign, seemingly uncontented with Jesus' teachings and miracles. And Jesus responds by saying that this is an evil generation, for it keeps asking for a sign. He gives them a portent of things to come by telling them that the only sign he will give them is to recall the story of Jonah. Jonah is the only prophet in the Bible who initially refuses his mission. He goes as far away from the pagan city of Nineveh, which is where God wanted him to be, to change the people's hearts. Eventually, after God saves him from three days of captivity inside a whale's belly, he relents and converts the people of Nineveh on God's side. Jesus also cites the Queen of Sheba, a Gentile or a pagan who came from afar to test the wisdom of Solomon and was convinced of the God he believed in. Such is the progression of the gospel readings we have had in the last few days. If you recall in last Saturday's gospel, a woman came to Jesus to praise his mother for raising him up. At the end of the short gospel, Jesus says, In the midst of those who still did not believe in him and his call to repentance and love, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Father Alphonse Nazaro narrates one instance with his friend, a student of philosophy, who was searching for the truth. He says, Our conversation is very philosophical. He is searching for the truth and yet cannot find it. He has placed all things in doubt, even his own existence. He is an extremely intelligent young man, but I think his studies have led him to think a little too much and to assume a little too little. During our conversation, I was reminded of the words spoken by Festus as he interrupted Paul's defense of the faith. You are out of your mind, Paul. Your studies are driving you insane. Of course, the major difference between Paul and Festus was that Paul had found the truth, first through a revelation, and then by reflection. Whereas Festus continued to rely too much on study and not enough on the big elephant in the room, the death and resurrection of Christ and the birth of the church. The truth is that God has every right to reveal himself to the world and what he has revealed in the greatest revelation ever to man. God is love. My suggestion to this young man was not just to follow the sheep and attend mass, but rather to begin to love. If you love, then you will discover God, because God is love, and we were made to fall in love. That is, we were made to fall in God's arms. Asking for signs from God or being given signs by God has been a common occurrence in the Old and New Testaments. Whether or not it should be frowned upon must be taken in the context of our faith. Signs are interesting and oftentimes controversial, and should be a very good topic for discussion and reflection in future vlogs. St. Augustine himself was prompted by a sign of conversion. He says, I was weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart when I heard the voice of children from a neighboring house chanting, take up and read, take up and read. I could not remember ever having heard the like. So checking the torrent of my tears, I arose, interpreting it to be no other than a command from God 
To open the book and read the first chapter, I should find. Eagerly then, I returned to the place where I had laid the volume of the Apostle. I ceased, opened, and in silence, read that section on which my eyes first fell. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. No further would I read, nor did I need to. For instantly, at the end of this sentence, it seemed as if a light of serenity infused into my heart and all the darkness of doubt vanished away. We must look at our asking for signs in the context of our relationship with God. Are we asking for signs to guide us in our decisions, limited and dependent as we are on our God? Or are we asking for further proof of God's existence because we have doubts? Jesus has presented himself to the Pharisees and scribes as the only sign they need, for he will die and resurrect in three days. If the pagans were convinced with the preaching of Jonah, how much more if it is Jesus himself already being the only sign they needed? We may initially balk at God's call to serve him, doing it reluctantly, half-heartedly, distracted by our worldly concerns. But just like Jonah, God is persistent in asking us to serve him to be his conduit of love, for it is God's love that conquers and converts unbelievers. He asks us to continue loving his children, especially those most difficult to love. Our detractors, those who slander us, those who hurt us and persecute us, those who refuse our hand of peace, those who do not understand us and have judged and condemned us. For it is only then that we will truly discover who God really is. When we fulfill His commandment of love, His sign of peace will consume our hearts. We only have to look at the example of Jesus and what He went through for us to claim and experience that ultimate sign of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant me the grace to respond to your call to love. And grant me that peace that will fill my heart as I respond to your call to serve you with love. This I pray in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your families, brothers and sisters. God bless our Catholic faith and couples for Christ.